the word. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Whatever. There was definitely a a big hit to Marco Rubio. You got to point to the debate for it. And, you know, the rest and the rest. Quali Fiorina, Chris Christie, it, it might be time to hit the road, old chaps. Uh, ben Carson, Mona Salama th- seems to think you should be around for South Carolina. I'm not so sure. I think you may have hit your high water mark, and, and that's pretty much it. But we shall see, because listen, this isn't the end of the journey, folks. We're on the road to 2016. We're on the road to picking a nominee. We're on the road to a new president of the United States by the end of the year. Very quickly, looking at the other side of the ledger, 59% right now, as we are taping this show, for Bernie Sanders, and Hillary has dropped below 40. That is a statement. You got to think, folks, that honesty has got to be a big factor. Fox News was talking about an exit poll where those who felt that honesty was the most important characteristic voted over 90% for Bernie Sanders. Over 90%. Wow. If that isn't a declaration, I don't know what is right now. Some of the people in our chat room wondering where Kasich came from in this race, and let's give him credit. Kasich put in the work in New Hampshire. There were a lot of voters out there that really responded to his message and and the time and energy he put in there. This, to me, is a crossroads moment for the Kasich campaign. Do you go all in? Do you go after the big money? Or do you hope to hang around, keep your name in the news, try to become the vice presidential pick, and just linger around and make sure that nobody forgets about you? Crossroads moment for the Kasich campaign. Jeb Bush, he's got to be feeling a little better about himself. I don't know if this is going to bring him in the money. He broke double digits. That's an accomplishment in these races. Does that mean that he's going to be seeing some money and seeing some love as we head towards Super Tuesday? I don't know. People are asking in the chat room that we have going at www.behindemylinesradio.us on our Listen Live page here during the live taping if Hillary is asleep or if she is aware of the results. (laughs) You know what? I know that Hillary is aware of the results. The reason why I know that is because the number's below 40. There is panic right now at Pierpont Street in Brooklyn, New York, in the People's Republic of New York City, at the main headquarters for Hillary Clinton. Politico is writing that there is no rudder on the campaign. There is no leader on message. There is a grassroots coordinator, a very good one, uh, according to them anyway. I'm not going to say how good he is. But at the same time, if there's no message, what is there to organize? If there's no message, what is there to believe in? If there's no message, what is there to get behind? If there's no message, what is there to donate to? Hillary Clinton's in trouble. I think she's in more trouble than she wants to let on. And I think the Democrats are going to start looking for another candidate because when you're stuck between the old socialist and the old Democrat, when you're stuck between the old white man and the old white woman, and you have a progressive base that looks to be to the left of Lenin. What do you think is going to happen? Someone in the chat room just said, are we going to be riding with Biden? Maybe Mike Bloomberg is the answer in an independent campaign. Who knows at this point? But it feels like there's no rudder on the ship. Time for a quick break here, folks. When we come back, we're going to have Dan Gaynor from Newsbusters on the line with us, talking and analyzing the New Hampshire race, talking about media coverage, how the media manipulates the vote, how media tries to influence the vote on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat. And then after that, we'll come back with a brand new segment, a debut here on Behind Enemy Lines. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet. Let's hear from our sponsors. Let's hear from Dan Gaynor. And I'll be right back. Gene Berardelli here, Behind Enemy Lines. I'll be back right after this brief word. I'm Vito. And I'm Vito. And we're from WNJC's The Vito and Vito Show. Every Friday at 1 p.m., you can hear Vito and Vito bring you the perspectives of two college-age millennial conservatives who are committed to defending the principles of free markets, liberty, freedom, and individualism 
from Brooklyn, New York. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Vito and Vito Show. And check out our blog posts and articles at VitoandVito.com. Vito and Vito Show, every Friday, 1 p.m. on WNJC 1360 AM, Philadelphia's Renaissance Station. In Brooklyn, it's nothing but the truth. There's a movement in healthcare today. It's a movement of people that's ready to stand up and take charge of their health care. It's people like you and me, who are tired of paying too much for health care and getting too little. People who are standing up for their values and letting their conscience make decisions based on timeless principles. It's a movement that's sweeping the nation, and you need to be a part of it. Liberty Health Share is leading the movement of people who are looking for an alternative to traditional health insurance. Liberty Health Share is a health care sharing organization of people who are sharing the cost of health care in an easy and efficient way. Choose your own doctor, your own hospital, and live out your values in health care. Join the movement. Together, we're changing health care for good. Go to www.joinlhs.com or call 800-722-8041. Who might you save? Your mother, your father, your husband, uncle, aunt, son. Learn fast. F-A-S-T. The sudden signs of a stroke and you could save. Your friend, teacher, boss. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T. That's F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. The sooner they get to the hospital, the sooner they'll get treatment. And that can make a remarkable difference in the recovery of your neighbor, the waiter, grandmother, grandfather. So learn FAST, the sudden signs of a stroke, then pass it on because you never know who might save you. Your wife, your colleague. Spot a stroke fast. Visit strokeassociation.org. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Behind enemy lines. Back on the air. Gene Baradelli back behind me lines and on the phone with me right now. Uh, we we took a week off this month, but I'm bringing them back just in time to talk about the elections and New Hampshire and all that fun stuff. From Newsbusters and Media Research Center, Dan Gaynor. Dan, how you doing, pal? I'm doing well tonight. It's been a it's been a busy weekend. If you were if you were a political sports fan, you you had everything to do. One debate one night and uh, Super Bowl the next. The intersection of politics and sports, they really do mirror each other. I mean, we talk a lot about that during this and other parts of the show as well. Uh, but, you know, I, I got to ask you, uh, in looking at the debates and in looking at the ramp up to New Hampshire, how did Marco Rubio go from being golden boy to punchline in the space of seven days? Well, because the media want that. See, if there's no controversy, if there's no big to-do about things, then, then people don't read them. So they create our heroes and they tear them the heck apart. So, so it, you know, I, I said this off air. So if you watched the Saturday night debate and you saw Chris Christie throw a curve at Marco Rubio, got Marco Rubio to stutter, because everybody in politics and everybody who does radio uses talking points from time to time. They rec- you get, you get a uh, patter that you use, like, oh, a subject comes up and you use certain phrases because it's what you do. We're human beings. We only got so much room in that darn brain of ours. So suddenly the media, I think one outlet may have been Politico, so it's not like it's a legitimate outlet, but I think they called it a debacle. Uh, you know, I, the big issue Saturday night wasn't that, but I'll get to that in a second. Then Sunday, we see the exact same thing. One of the guys who had one of the best seasons in the history of football, Cam Newton, goes into the Super Bowl, but it's his first time in the real big spotlight, and the irresistible force meets the immovable object, and history proves the immovable object usually wins. And so Cam Newton had a presser afterwards, and he probably had one of the worst days of his entire life, humiliated in front of a billion people or so, uh, let his team down. That's the way he views the world. And you know, people are, are you know, carpet at him, and he walks off. Suddenly the media, oh, my gosh, bad leadership. He's a horrible role model. The world's over. You know, if you want to talk about something, talk about the game. So 
Saturday night, let's talk about the game. The game was Chris Christie, who you know, so obviously abused Marco Rubio for a couple seconds. He's the one who came up with an excuse in saying that uh, rape you know, and incest, oh, well, abortion there is okay. It's in defense of the woman. You could argue that. Whereas Marco Rubio came up with the best defense of pro-life you hear likely here in this election or any election, scoring huge points with conservative voters. That's the real story. The media too dense to understand it. And the real story is that Cam Newton game, don't complain about the press conference. Complain the man didn't die for the fumble. Okay, you know, I, I'm a Ravens fan, which may or may not float well with the, the listening audience, but we had a quarterback we drafted who honestly wasn't good enough to carry Cam Newton's luggage. That's Kyle Bowler. First-round pick like Cam, but nowhere near as good. But I'll say one thing about Kyle Bowler. If he dropped the ball, if anybody dropped that ball, he'd be the first guy on the ground to get it. And, so, and that's the game of football. So focus on the darn game. Focus on what really matters, not focus on some pumped up, ginned up garbage that only people who live inside the beltway give a damn about. Absolutely. Now, obviously, okay, I'm going to let the Ravens fan thing go. I'm going to let it go without a comment. <laughs> but, okay, go Giants, by the way. Um, here's the other thing that I noticed, and this also has to do with Marco Rubio. And it's going to be played out again today in New Hampshire. There was the winner of the primary, and then the media's winner of the primary. Of course, I'm talking about Ted Cruz, who actually won. But Marco Rubio, because he exceeded expectations, was the guy who really won. Same thing's going to happen tonight with Donald Trump being the winner, but John Kasich or Jeb Bush being the actual winner. Is this the media's way to downgrade and downplay whoever is the most popular candidate, according to the voters? Well, the, the media, see, the media live in permanent fear that somebody's going to pick somebody and they're, they're part of the, their role in all this ends. So the fact that there were 16 candidates at one point, uh, you know, that, that full employment for journalists. Oh, my God, anybody can say anything about somebody and just keep on talking and talking and tons of stories. No one cares. There are realistically at this point, you know, according to most conservative pundits, three viable presidential candidates in the GOP side. Everybody else is running for VP. And so if it's not Trump, it's not Rubio, it's not Cruz, you know, why are we talking about it? Jeb Bush you know, couldn't beat me in a national election. Uh, and, that's, and that's just the, the, the reality of things. Uh, you know, the, the media, I, I got a discussion with somebody from NPR one day on Facebook, and he, and I, and he didn't understand why people don't like Jeb Bush. He's so, so conservative. I said, do you know anything about the Common Core? He didn't even believe Common Core was an issue. Common Core is a huge issue with conservative voters, huge issue with conservative media. Media don't understand that. So what, what this enables the media to do is do what they've always done. They want to pick the winner. Oh, it doesn't matter that Ted Cruz was the first Hispanic to ever win an election, you know, for, for a primary election in the history of the United States. Eh, who cares? If he were a Democrat, it would be enormous. It would be, it would be front page banner headlines. Hispanic wins presidential caucus. Oh my gosh. You know, 60% of the GOP voters in Iowa voted for a minority candidate. 100% of Democratic voters voted for somebody who's old and white. Why don't the media that talk about fantastic. that? That you is know, fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. I love that line. I'm going to use it. I'm going to steal it. You're welcome to. I, I mean, it, it is, it's ludicrous that they won't tell you that, but they don't tell you that because that's a conservative meme, and they don't want to say it. They don't ever want to give any, any acknowledgement. I, you know, then they end up caught up in this ridiculous garbage where you're actually got geezer liberals telling young female liberals that if they don't vote for Hillary Clinton, they're going to hell. Yeah, Madeline Albright, oh, well, you're going to go to hell. That, that's how desperate the left is to reinforce Hillary's candidacy. The media, if, if some right-winger said something as absolutely certifiably insane as that, it would lead broadcasts. 
There's, there's not a double standard. There's never a double standard in the media. There's one standard. Whatever reporters agree with is news. Whatever they disagree with is not news. If somebody does something bad on the right, it's automatically news.